Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. I'm your host, Elizabeth Lund. Today my guest is Susan Edwards Richmond, a passionate ecologist who writes about the relationship between humans and the natural world. Susan is poet in residence at Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio in Harvard, Mass, where she curates a Poem of the Month blog on the farm's website. She also hosts an annual plein air poetry walk and edits a corresponding chapbook. Susan is the author of five books of poems, including her most recent work, Before We Were Birds. Her poems have appeared in a variety of anthologies and journals and have also been featured on NPR's Living on Earth and presented in gallery shows with other artists. She has taught writing in a variety of settings, from the University of California, Davis, where she earned her MA, to Emerson College and MCI Shirley, a medium security men's prison. No matter where she speaks or teaches, Susan emphasizes the importance of community, compassion, and the possibility of transformation. Susan, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. You have a fantastic bio and a wonderful new book. Would you share a poem from the book? Sure, I'd love to. Um, the book is actually uh, organized around three sequences. So the first one mm -hmm. is called Bodo, and it's based on the myth of the Amazon pink river dolphin that is a shapeshifter that can turn into a human shape and lure people back to underwater depths. So I'm going to read one of the poems from that selection uh, called Arrival. He comes from underwater cities, a busy life, streets lined with, how do they tell it, panpipes and market squares, children playing his own, others, comes out of the river at night, a man dressed in white, the moon hovers and tilts, a bowl half empty, half full. He is searching for other music and finds her, open, eager for his secrets, where before a ripple sufficed, her heart's yearning a glimpse, pink as sunset, gray as rain. Now she dances for a spell, her hand on his flank, real enough. She cannot tell, waking, from sleeping. Eyes wide as the Ancante, he takes her down by the river, changes the chemistry of her body, leaves her a kiss. That is such an evocative poem. I love the language, the way it moves, and also the fact that the poem is so layered. There's desire, there's question of the unknown, and then this woman stepping into a new life. What attracted you to that myth? Well, it was interesting how I learned about it. I was actually developing a science curriculum for a group called the Jason's Foundation for Education, and uh, they do experiential learning, and the experience that year was in the Peruvian Amazon, mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity to um, I was transcribing an interview with a shaman who was telling a story about these river dolphins and learned mm -hmm. that it's a very widespread story. And in doing further research, um, I learned that a lot of people do believe in this shape-shifting dolphin, but it also can become kind of an interesting way to explain disappearances, um, babies <laughs> that, that appear. Um, sort of unexplained relationships or longings and the whole idea I think of having this this submerged world um, to which you could enter was very interesting and uh, attractive to me. I think for myself I was also in this period when I had young children and was changing careers and trying to figure out what role writing played in my own life and oh. for me that was kind of an underwater world and a place mm -hmm. to go to be someone different and so I kind of immersed myself in that in that mythology in the poem. That is wonderful. Did you expect that this poem would lead you to a whole book of poems? I, I didn't really know where it would lead. I started just kind of writing 
little excerpts in, in, the, in my journal. I would read and I would scribble down things that I had researched, little lines that came to me at night. It was definitely an assembly project. It was not something where I sat down and wrote um, long pieces of verse. It was lines um, that would come to me or um, a, a quatrain or maybe a piece of a poem. I didn't really know where it would lead until finally I realized that, that they, all the poems kind of cohered even ones that I didn't really know were part of it originally. Um, I wasn't writing exclusively this poem at the time, but you sort of, s it started to glom together and you realize that it's all part of the same piece. And uh, at the same time, I was, I was reading I, this book called um, The Amazon Pink River Dolphin, um, Amazon Quest by Cy Montgomery. And she also talked about this mythology and that book became a real touchstone for me. And I corresponded with Sai, and she was very generous. She's a wonderful, wonderful mentor and teacher. And she really liked the poem, and she encouraged me to try to publish it. And it was actually her who suggested that I send the manuscript to Peter De Davison, who was an editor at The Atlantic at the time. And he said, well, it's not quite right for me, but I hear there's a really wonderful publisher in Western Mass um, in East Hampton. And I looked him up, and that was Gary Mitris at Adoster Press. And I submitted it, and sure enough, he selected that poem to make a chapbook out of that, that next year. And mm -hmm. I was thrilled, and that was my first book length. Well, it's not book length, but chapbook publication. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you decided that there was more to tell about that mm -hmm. story, and also mm -hmm. the idea of transformation, because as the book evolves, mm -hmm. you start out taking us sort of underwater, mm -hmm. and then later, you take us up mm -hmm. into the trees. <laughs> Well, I'm a passionate birder. I absolutely love birding. I've been doing it since I was a child. And I've always written a lot of poems with birds in them, uh, based on close observations of single birds, or groups of birds, or just the idea of being out in nature and experiencing bird song, as well as other wildlife animals. Um, I don't think I knew for a very, very long time that um, Bodo was going to be part of a larger book. Um, I think I just was writing poems about birds and, and transformation because for me that's where I'm most inspired and moved to write is out in nature. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm also really interested in the stories and mythologies behind place and I published uh, you know other chapbooks in between that period between Bodo and Before We Were Birds one Purgatory Chasm was about the place in Sutton, Massachusetts, the state reservation there. And that, again, was just going to that place and writing about it um, mm -hmm. over a long period of time. So there were a lot of other poems that, were, that I was developing, but I think that uh, over time, maybe it was the Kingfisher Ring, that mythology which is at the center of this book, um, because I began to look for places and birds that had stories but behind them, and I learned about the, metamor the metamorphosis myth of Syax and Alcyon, who are uh, grieving lovers. Syax goes off to war and is killed in a, in a storm, and his body washes up on the shore, and Alcyon, in her grief, goes down to claim his body. Mm -hmm. And in the myth, in the myth um, Al Alcyon's father is Aeolus, the god of the wind, and he changes them into kingfisher birds and brings them back to life. Mm -hmm. So I just loved that story and it was, I was writing it in the aftermath of 9-11 and I think mm -hmm. I was just thinking a lot about people going to war and the reasons mm -hmm. that people go to war and the kinds of transformations, although I wasn't myself and I didn't have a close family member um, involved, just it was in the atmosphere and just thinking about those kinds of transformations as well. So I kind of updated the story and set it in kind of a, a mythical war, but one that could be taking place now. And mm -hmm. you know, that was a long time ago when I first started to write that piece. And uh, unfortunately, the climate of war in the world hasn't really changed mm -hmm. a whole lot since then. Mm -hmm. And that may be why the bird poems resonate so beautifully because there is still that need for transformation and for lift. Would you read one of the bird poems? Sure. Um, I was just going to read the first 
poem from the sequence, The Kingfisher Ring. It's actually the title poem of the, of the book, but not the exact title, as you'll see. It's called Before They Were Birds, and it kind of sets the stage for the myth when they're uh, Alcyon and Syax, our king and queen. Before They Were Birds. In affinity for blues and greens, they shared a feather bed, feasts of herring and shad roe on a simple table. They didn't trouble the gods and the beaks and talons of the gods let them be. They were, like most couples, inured to their fortune. She was a daughter of the wind, he the day star's child. Beneath stippled skin, her beating heart flushed red across her breast. Mm. And those last lines is, is actually a, an interesting detail about kingfisher birds themselves. Um, I always like to include, even when I'm writing mythology, to include very accurate details about the animals and birds and environments as much as I can. And in the bird world, most birds, um, most, usually it's the male bird that's more colorful than the female bird, but the, the kingfisher, the female bird actually does have red in her, across her breast and the male mm -hmm. bird does not. So. Mm. <laughs> I put that into the poem. That is a lovely poem. And one of the things that intrigues me about it is the fact that the title is Before They Were Birds. And yet the title of the book is Before We Were Birds. Tell us a little bit about that transformation, because it sounds like <laughs> transformation of the poet, not just of the speaker in the poems. Yes, and it was a transformation of the title too, because originally I had thought, well, originally the book had a number of different titles. At one point I was considering calling it Familiar, which is now what the, the inter-segments are called in between the sequences, um, after the animal, the spirit animal guide, as well as things that are familiar. Um, but I thought about calling the book Before They Were Birds, until I realized that the book really was about a lot of individual transformations and mm -hmm. covered a period of time that was very transformative for me from when my children were very small to them being grown and off to college and now they're actually graduated from college so they've flown mm -hmm. in a way um, but it was that sort of movement that lifting upward and I thought yes it applies to me too and in a way I think going through that transformation gave me a greater sense of who I was at a, as a writer and what mm -hmm. I wanted to do um, in my life. And um, I guess you realize that as you get older too, you, you have to start thinking about that. Your, your time is limited to an extent. And, and so maybe that was kind of a, a way of thinking of we all transform and hopefully we can transform upward out of whatever experiences we've had and become something mm -hmm. in flight. Yeah, that is so beautifully stated. And you have definitely taken flight as a poet. You've had a lot of wonderful successes recently. How does being appreciated by your peers and by readers and editors, how does that encourage you or change you as a writer? I think just having a little confidence is very helpful. Um, as you know, we're in an area that is filled with extraordinarily talented writers, poets, as well as, you know, people writing in every, every medium. So I don't think it's, you, you never get a real, a big head over it. <laughs> you never feel like, you're near the top, but what you do feel is that you have gained entrance into the community. Mm -hmm. um, that I think that before publication, it's it's has it's harder. It's you feel a little hesitant. Like, do you really belong with mm -hmm. with this community, with this group? And even having one publication, even having when Bodo first came out, I think it emboldened me to think, yes, I can be part of this. And that was when I became part of the Concord. Poetry Center and started doing more things, doing, doing more readings and, um, and reading with others and attending more and just and becoming part of that. Mm -hmm. But I also have really enjoyed 
kind of helping to create that community because mm -hmm. once you feel that you have a little foothold in it, then you can start thinking about what is it that I want to do? What, what are my interests and concerns? What do I share with others? Mm -hmm. What is distinct in, in my view and in, in my writing? And mm -hmm. um, how can I grow that part of the community? So mm -hmm. I think that's another thing that I've kind of moved forward with in the last maybe 10 years or so, five to 10 years. In your work as poet in residence at the farm, you mm -hmm. certainly are nurturing community. And you're also nurturing an appreciation for the ways that poetry connects to the natural world in that setting. Do you consciously think about the connections between language that is alive mm -hmm. and the farm, which is one of the few certified organic farms in Massachusetts? Well, Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio is a very, very special place. I don't know, I've never known another place quite like it. Um, it really came about, um, the woman who purchased it, Linda Hoffman, is a sculptor and a writer, and she was that long before, before she was a farmer. And she was originally, um, she purchased the place as a place that she could create art. Um, it was going to first and foremost be a studio for her sculpture. Um, it just so happened that she bought this orchard that my family was already familiar with, that we knew the previous owners, and it had been our favorite orchard to go picking at. Mm. And I had known Linda only a little bit through work at the, with the um, Acton Boxborough Cultural Council. We had done a sculpture exhibit, and she had been part of it. So I had met her before, but I didn't know her well. And there was some event that I was um, invited to, and I ended up at this farm and suddenly realized, oh, this is a and Orchards. <laughs> this is the place that I've been with my daughters. And um, I was so excited and so excited to realize that Linda wanted to do, to bring back the farm also, to bring back the orchard, mm -hmm. but as an organic orchard, to have an organic farm um, and to pull this whole community together, to blend sustainable agriculture with art, with poetry. Um, and it's a really interesting group of a community that she's formed there and um, she invited me to be part of it with a couple of projects. Wild Apples was a journal that we created together with um, some other colleagues as well. But this plein air poetry walk is something she invited me to do. I had done it at Fruitlands one year um, where we had a juried um, plein air poetry event based on some sculptures and, and the grounds of Fruitlands. And it was very successful, and I met a lot of poets that way. We, it, originally, it was juried, it was blind. We didn't know who we were selecting. Um, I realized I selected several people that I did know, that I already knew, which was a wonderful pleasure, and many people that I did not know at all. Um, but when I wanted to do it at Fruitlands again, they didn't really quite have the, wasn't even much of a budget. But anyway, it wasn't the direction that they wanted to go in. And Linda said, well, why don't you do it here? Mm -hmm. So she's been so supportive. Um, this year, we're doing it for the fifth year. And I started really by letting the people that I had met through the Fruitlands um, event know that I was doing this. And then they would suggest names. And I knew some other people from other poetry connections, like the Concord Poetry Center. And I just would invite people each year, and, and it kind of grew. The first year we had 10 poets. This year we have 25. So, mm -hmm. And I think that you know, the quality of the poetry has grown, mm -hmm. and the poets have grown, and they've met each other. And we have grown to support one another. Now we go to, you know, many of them have published books, and we go to each other's readings. And um, they're really from all over the region, not just from Harvard or Acton, Boxborough, but um, you know, Roslindale and the North Shore. And um, they've come from quite quite a ways to come walk on the farm and, and write about it. So that was about building community. And I wonder if I've lost the thread of your original question. <laughs> no, you haven't lost the yeah. thread at all. You've sort of anticipated and already answered a question uh, I was going to ask, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out to me when we chatted on the phone recently was the fact that you were so grounded in a sense of place. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is important to you, a connection with the earth, but also a connection with community. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit yeah. about why 
place is so important? Well, I think that the plein air was really born out of my passion for being outdoors, and that most of my writing, I at least begin outdoors, or I begin with something that I've experienced outdoors. So that's very important to me. Um, but I think that place is so important in our society today because I think a lot of people kind of lose the sense of that. Um, even if you live in a community, in a town, um, a lot of times your work is very distant from that or you work at home and the community that you have are not the people who are necessarily in your immediate environment. And there's certainly exceptions to that, but um, I think we don't, often appreciate the place where we live and the places in our immediate surroundings because we're so interested in something that's further away, that's other, that we can yeah. access through a screen, um, through com some kind of remote virtual experience, which, which can be valuable and can have a place. But mm -hmm. if you have a conservation area within a block of your home, why not yeah. explore that? I mean, that's important. And I think that what people don't realize is that it's that connection that's going to preserve those places. Mm -hmm. um, there's only so much that most people are going to be able to do about appreciating a place that's very distant, fr distant from them, that they're just enjoying by watching it on the computer screen or on, on television. But if it's your own community and you come to care about it, first of all, it pulls your community together. You get to know other people around you and you have, and you preserve that place. And I think that that's, really important because we are at a point where so much of our earth is threatened and what I love about the plein air project is that um, I mean plein air technically just means French and it just means writing out of doors or out of doors um, but I think the element that I like to bring to it is also the in situ component which is writing about a particular place as you say it's you know in mm -hmm. situ we usually think of more with science or with sculpture that it's done in place, done in the field. And people don't really associate that so much with poetry, but I think that when you go to a place and are awakened by something particular in the environment and then are able to share that experience, that that can be really powerful. And that's what we ask the poets to do in the plein air, is to come to the farm and not just write out of doors, but be awakened and drawn to something in the landscape, whether it's the apple orchard or the way the water is running over the waterfall or a heron that's poised in the pond. Mm -hmm. um, but something to see that beauty and for the poet to connect. And there are poets who weren't necessarily plein air writers but wanted to come and write in the farm and it transformed their idea of what they could write about and what they wanted to write about. Um, but also we have it, it's open to the public this year, our, our poetry walk is on September 17th at the farm, and it's open to the public. We all walk around the farm, and I think that people get a very different sense of poetry when they see it connected to something very specific. If someone reads a poem about seeing an animal or a bird or someone pulling a vegetable out of the ground or an apple growing on a tree and then actually sees it, or even sees it in, a, in another season, which is very interesting, because sometimes people come and they, they write about the, in the early spring, and then we have the walk in the fall, and the landscape itself has transformed. Something that maybe, a tree that was maybe pretty much barren when the poem was written is now covered with leaves and fruit, or water that was rushing mm -hmm. and roaring with the spring flood is suddenly still and stagnant, and I think that that is also, um, it's just a very interesting um, education about about the land and, and the power of the transformative the transformative power of Earth, um, the Earth itself. Does that transformative power inspire many of your poems? I think it does. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. And for me, most poems do sort of begin with wondering about something that I I see something in the landscape, I and mean, there's a poem in here called Piping Plover, and I did a lot of um, birding at Joppa Flats, a Mass Audubon sanctuary up in Newburyport. They have Wednesday morning birding, and when I had a different schedule than I have now, I used to go up there and participate in Wednesday morning birding every now and then, and there's a lot of poems in this book 
that actually were inspired by those experiences. But the experience of seeing this little piping plover just kind of scurrying along the sand and watching it and mm -hmm. watching it so carefully, not just saying, oh, that's a sandpiper, but watching the kind of detail. What does it really look like? What do the feathers look like? What's the texture? How does it blend into the environment? Um, and then why, why did I notice it? What did it mean to me? Mm -hmm. why, was, why did that bird out of you know, a dozen other birds that I may have seen this morning draw me? Because I might not know. I don't probably know. That's what makes the poem is that writing towards that discovery. And then when you suddenly find it in the poem as you're writing, you're like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even know that was there. Um, and that's the exciting part of writing, I guess, is to see, not to have the poem and say, oh, I understand this. I want to tell people about this. But instead mm -hmm. to say, wow, this is really intriguing. It's really sticking with me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find out. I like that description because you're really honing in on the necessity of discovery and the pleasure of discovery in poetry. And mm -hmm. that relates to transformation. So we are almost out of time. Would you read oh. one more poem sure. from the book? I would love to. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Homage or Behead. Um, or Behead is actually in Prince Edward Island, and this was from a family vacation. It was an observation that I made. Um, Homage or Behead. When I can go no farther and the maps are all blue, I count the birds at the end of the world swoop down from their russet watchtowers, long, low lines of silhouette stoop to the waves. Piebald buoys bob in the lee of rocks. Plump-bellied gourds with red waders on troll the bricky stone. Arms clasp over pulled-up knees, salted by the wet perimeter of light. Gathering in the past, shapes stream by Great auk, Labrador duck, and Eskimo curlew in venerated waves, all plucked, bloodied, and damned. Shingles crack in the tides, ruddy contusions. We have everything to lose and have again and again. <laughs>